Welcome to the Rebecca Conference of 2020. I am Jenny Henry Payne, and I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit about how I found hope on the road to redemption. First of all, though, I want to thank you ladies for the music. That was wonderful. Um, there's nothing like getting some worship music going to get you guys pumped up and ready and just ready to listen to different stories and see how other people have found hope in things. Um, mine is, of course, the hope found on the road to redemption. And I really thought about what your life would look like if it was laid out like a roadmap. So what would your life look like? What towns would be on your map? Would you guys have maybe a Pleasantville on your map or a Beats that you're just so beat up and just had it for that day? What about a town of hope? Did you know that in the U.S. alone, <laughs> there's only over 26 towns that are called hope? So hope is out there if you just open your eyes and look for it. Or Google it, kind of like how I did. But it's out there. I mean, hope is out there. What about twists and turns on your roadmap? Or some bridges or bumps along the way? Um, what about any do not enter signs? Now, if we're being honest, I know that I would have several do not enter signs put up. I don't want somebody to go down there. I've already been down there, and let me tell you, you don't want to go back. And I myself don't want to make that same mistake again. So I'd love to put that sign up and be like, don't go back. <laughs> You've already been down there, and it's not worth it. I mean... We've all had some ups and downs and rocky roads that we've all been down in life. And if you notice, like when you're driving, if you notice, if you look up in your rearview mirror, it's, it's smaller than the windshield. I mean, it's, you know, it's, a good, it's smaller than the windshield. And I really think that's because we don't need to focus on our past. You know, what our main focus should be on is what lies ahead of us and what's in front of us, and what God has planned for us. I mean, if we just keep our eyes faced on the future, I think that's really what God wants for us. That's exactly like in um, Deuteronomy 31.6. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them. For it is the Lord your God who goes with you, and he will never leave you nor forsake you. After this year of chaos and uncertainty, the one thing that I'm certain is that I know that my future is with Jesus in heaven. And I'm so thankful for that and for the gift that he's given me. Um, you know, God doesn't need a rearview mirror. He knows exactly what's going on. So I'd rather him be the driver than me any day. Because let's face it, when I'm in control, um, it's not good. I mean, I crash and burn every time. So I let God lead my life and lead what, what he wants for me. Um, i give you guys a little backstory. Um, I was a shy kid. And if you know me now, you're probably scratching your head thinking, whoa, back up here, lady. Um, I was. I was a shy kid. Uh, but honestly, I was a little different. Uh, I was always taller than everybody, and I was always bigger than everybody. Um, so I was shy. I felt awkward. For one instance, in second grade, I remember there's two rows that we were all sitting on, and all the kids were sitting on the rows. And I was waiting to get picked so I could sit on the row, and the teacher's picking all the kids out. And instead, I end up sitting, or standing actually, in the back with her. I was as tall as my second grade teacher. Um, so I was, you know, over five foot, over five foot when I was in second grade. So I was awkward. Um, but the good thing, though, is uh, it, leaded, it led me to actually excel in sports. So um, I love sports. I put everything I had into sports when I was younger. And I was good at it, basically because I towered over everybody. I mean, my goodness. Um, so I played softball, volleyball, I played basketball, you know, I just truly enjoyed sports. And I think that's where I really started to learn what being faithful was, because you were faithful to your team. You always showed up, 
you always went to practice, and you were there for your teammates. And it's just kind of like how God is faithful to us, even though we have not always been for him. Um, 2 Timothy 2.13, if we are unfaithful, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny who he is. I've let God down time and time again. And he has always been there for me. I don't care if it's the middle of the day and I'm driving, ticked off in my car, can't sleep, having a bad night. No matter what the hour is or when it is, God has been there for me time and time again. And I've, sometimes I've failed him on a daily basis or hourly. I mean, I have, uh, none of us are perfect, but I've been far from perfect many a time. Um, I always believed in God, you know, when I was younger. I always believed in God. We didn't really go to church, though. Um, we went on Easter or, like, Christmas Eve service. Sometimes when I was a kid, we'd go to VBS during the summer. It just has, you know, something to do. But I never really had a relationship with God. Um, I knew the Bible stories. I knew about Noah and the ark and the flood. And, um, you know, of course, Daniel's in the lion's den. Daniel just kept... Believing in God. Um, but I just didn't really have a relationship with him. Then, um, as I got into high school, I started to kind of come out of that shy um, girl mentality that I had. And how I did that was, you know, the normal thing. When you go to high school, you start partying a little. What I thought was normal. I started drinking and smoking marijuana, and that made me a different person. I came out of my shell, real talkative and loud, and and I did that for a while, and I kind of grew confidence where and everybody else was getting as tall as I was. So I did that for a while. Then we moved, and I put my heart back into basketball again. And I got injured, and at... 17, I had my first surgery. And I wouldn't play basketball again, um, but where I got to where I could walk around, I realized I was depressed because I couldn't play basketball again. Or I couldn't play any sports. I just really um, kind of sunk into a, a depression. And I was, uh, you know, I was upset. So what did I do? I reverted back to my old ways. I started drinking and smoking pot. And I did that on the weekends. And I started having house parties at my house um, because I thought that was normal. You know, that was typical behavior. And I met a guy from high school and we really hit it off. Um, we mainly hit it off because he had a haircut. <laughs> we didn't date in high school because he had this big, huge <laughs> hillbilly afro that just was not flattering. Um, so we hit it off and, uh, you know, we weren't ready to get serious at all. I was told in high school, actually, that I could never have kids. So we were never really, never in a hurry to settle down. We just thought, mm, have fun and enjoy life. So we did. And, uh, the party in on the weekends and we would start our careers and we held that down for a few years, and that went really well um, until we ended up thinking we had everything together. And um, because of my injury, and he had a previous injury as well, we got prescribed medicine from the doctor, which we never thought it was wrong because it was from the doctor. And... Um, Ended up, of course, partying on the weekend and taking our medicine daily because we needed it. So one day we ran out of our medicine and we were extremely sick. So 
we went to buy medicine on the street. And, you know, that was time. Then we got our, the next month came along and we got our medicine again and we started where we were taking it uh, more frequently. It wasn't every four hours. We were taking it because it made us feel good. So we ended up the next time going to buy enough not only to support ourselves, but we figured we would sell some because that way we could make money and have our medicine. I even thought, um, why not just stay home and sell this because I could make more money than my job. So I ended up staying home and selling medicine to support our habit. And I say medicine because that's what I thought it was at the time. When, in fact, I was a drug dealer. I mean, I was a full-blown drug dealer. And um, it was hard to admit for a while, it really was, that I was actually a drug dealer. And, of course, that lasted for a while, and we thought everything was fine. Um, we held it all together until of the medicine ran out. We couldn't get our pain pills anymore. So we were very sick, and I wasn't sure what to do. And I, I never really thought I was a, a drug addict, or uh, I still kind of had denial and thought I was in the partying phase. We were so sick without the medicine, I did something that uh, I never thought I would do. Because I wasn't a junkie. But in reality, I was. I stuck a needle in my arm that day, and I used heroin, and I wasn't sick anymore. I felt great, and everything was, I thought, it was just going to make my life better. It's cheaper, it's so much easier, when in reality, I was spiraling out of control. It got to where it was so expensive. We ended up stealing uh, because we lost everything we had. We lost our home. We lost everything. We ended up stealing and making methamphetamine to support our heroin habit. And, of course, if you're making methamphetamine, you're going to use methamphetamine. So here I was making methamphetamine and on heroin. I was a full-blown junkie, something that I never thought I would be, when in fact I was. I truly felt lost and hopeless. Um, and to be honest, I was in a jail. I pushed everybody away. I ended up, um, I didn't want to listen to anybody. You know, I was in and out of jail, I was on probation. Pushed my mom away. Nothing mattered to me. I um, pushed my mom away, and then also I ended up going to borrow my dad's car one day. And he had two broken feet at the time, and he was, of course, bedridden with two broken feet, and he had a wheelchair, and I left him for a week. And I didn't care. He didn't have food. He had to take his wheelchair to the gas station to get food. I didn't care. The only thing I cared about was feeding my addiction. Um, I just cared about myself. I was so selfish. And, and I felt hopeless. I felt like I was pushing everybody away because I didn't want them to really know what was going on inside of me, being honest. The in and out of jail and the probation that I was on. I mean, we were just losing it. We were going, it was just a downhill plunder. Um, we ended up having to move in with my boyfriend's mother. And she had two rules. Rule number one, the doors lock at midnight. So regardless if you're in the house or not, the doors are locked. And rule number two, <laughs> you've got to go to church on Sunday. 
the dr drug addict scheme in me, I was like, score, I got to do community service anyways. <laughs> so, hey, I can pull this off. I can do the community service. They're never going to know that I'm a drug addict. I mean, I could clean the church building and everything will be okay. I thought, hey, this is going to work out good. Um, little did I know things were going to change. Um, we would go to church on Sunday morning. Sometimes I'll be very, very honest. Sometimes I couldn't even hold my eyes open. I couldn't even hold my head up. Uh, I was so high and so out of it. And then I would look around at everyone and they had a the big smile on their faces and they were praising Jesus. And I thought, man, these people have it together. Like, I was jealous, you know? What do they have that I don't have? I didn't have a clue, but I wanted it. I wanted what they had. They look so happy and so content. They had struggles and problems of their own, but I couldn't tell. I just knew that I wanted what they had. 1 Corinthians 3, 7. So then neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but it's God who causes growth. And to really think about that. And to think about what seeds are you planting right now? It's God that really causes the growth. But as your daily walk with Christ, what seeds are you planting? What impact are you making on everybody else? I didn't realize till later that that's God had started the growth in me that day. And going to that church, he really started for me to grow, and for me to see what was going on. And it took a while. It took a while because it wasn't until, it was a Friday the 13th, actually, of 2007, that uh, my world was going to change. Um, I am hiding under the bed in the house as my boyfriend is getting arrested and the police are looking for me. And I thought, oh my gosh, you know, I had warrants and by that time I was a full-blown heroin and crack addict. And they took him to jail. And that wasn't the highlight of my day by any means. I, um, the day progressed, I felt sick. I felt really sick. And I didn't know if it was bad heroin or I was smoking bad crack. I had no idea. Because it didn't matter where it came from. I, I was a junkie. I was a full-blown junkie. And for some reason, I just felt like I needed to go get a pregnancy test. At 11.30 at night, my boyfriend's mom comes home, who I have to tell her, by the way, oh, your son just got arrested. is in jail. But... Can you take me to Walmart because I need a pregnancy test? It didn't go over very well. Um, but she did. She took me. And I was honest with her. I said, because I don't know what's going on. I'm sick. After the third positive pregnancy test, I really started realizing that I'm pregnant. I am pregnant. And I'm a full-blown junkie. I really thought I couldn't be pregnant. You know, why me? You know, I mean, I'm a horrible person. You know, left my dad for a week. Can you imagine me taking care of a baby? I didn't know how I was going to raise a kid. And then how far along was I? Because I have been sticking a needle in my arm every day. And smoking crack every day. So who knows how far along I am. So that day, I ended up calling the... Uh, actually, I called the health department, and I called the local hospital. 
That's the last day that I smoked cocaine. And I ended up detoxing myself uh, until that was on a Friday the 13th. So I ended up going to the doctor on Monday who told me, who prescribed me pain pills to come off the heroin because I couldn't stop cold turkey at the risk of losing the baby. The next few weeks were, they were rough. They were not comfortable at all. You know, I was withdrawing and detoxing myself when my boyfriend was in jail and he got out and I was trying to stay clean. He was up and down, he would do stuff and then he wouldn't. And about three months goes by, and I'm clean. And actually, it was July 7th of 2007. Um, there was a knock at the door, and it was late in the evening, dark, and it was the police. And they were there to pick up my boyfriend, his brother, and me. We all had warrants. And I was so mad. Here I'm trying to do the right thing, I thought. And we all went to jail that day. And we get in there and they give us all a drug test and they're both dirty and I'm actually clean. But I could hear the guards talking about how I'm going to get shipped to a women's prison and have my baby and they're going to give my child up for adoption. And what type of mother would I have been anyways, right? But the reason I went to jail, I think the reason I was so mad, it was a $35 fine. And I had 35 bucks. I said, here, I'll pay. I, you know, and that wasn't it. And that's mad. You know, I had been going to church. I really hadn't dedicated my life at all. I just was showing up because that's what I thought you did. And I thought, boy, here, I'm trying to turn myself around. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, God. Now you're going to take my baby and put, him up, put my child up for adoption. As I sat the next day, I hear a, a man walking around to all the cells, and he makes his way over to my cell door and asks me what was going on. And that's when I lost it. My life was unmanageable. As I sat there in a jail cell, uh, not knowing how long I was going to be there, knowing that God actually gave me a gift of a child, and I screwed it up, wondering what this child would look like anyways, because it might have been heroin, and crack, and meth, anything. I was clean, but... There's a month and a half that I was really bad. And um, and I just, I let it out. I mean, I cried and I told him that night that I really, I really needed help. And I really wanted to turn away from what I was doing and I was really trying. Um, and I didn't really pour my heart out to him as much as I just poured my heart out to God. And I asked for forgiveness for what I had done because I was a piece of work, I tell you. Um, and I can truly say that was the first night of my life that I truly felt at peace. And that was because I was filled with the Holy Spirit that night. And then I asked to be forgiven for my sins. And to truly have Jesus in my heart. Um, Acts 3.19 is, You repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out. That times of refreshing may come from the Lord. And the, they'll be wiped out. I mean like a clean slate. Because I'm going to tell you what. Even though you can't forget what you've done. If you ask forgiveness, God can. 
In 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. To be completely purified from my sins. That's the only thing that I needed was Jesus in my life. And to accept him in my heart. Um, the next few days I had went to court. And I didn't know what was going to happen. And I got up there and they told me that I was ordered to leave the state. And with a heavy heart, I did. I did. My boyfriend was in the jail, in the courtroom with me. And I left him. I had to leave. I had to leave everything. Because that was the only way I was going to protect my unborn child. Trusting that God had a plan and a path for me, if I did that, that was all it took for me, is to finally trust God. In Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through who Christ who strengthens me. Talk about unknown. Here, start your life over and leave the state within 72 hours. I didn't know what was on my path, what at all was on the road ahead. But I was ready. I knew God was the driver and in control, and I was ready to move on with my life. Um, that was in 2007. It was over 13 years ago. And um, to say my life has been perfect would be a lie. Um, I try not to sin on a daily basis, but my mouth gets the best of me, to be honest. And I have a wonderful, healthy 13-year-old son. So sometimes my mouth does get the best of me. But I know if I repent and turn from my sins that Jesus will be there for me. Also, the boyfriend that was in the jail with me ended up becoming an associate pastor. And uh, we married in October of 2007. <sighs> the things that I accomplished in my life with God in control instead of me. I teach Sunday school. I've done children's church. But what really gets my heart is helping other people deal with their addictions and things that they can overcome. I know I'm not alone. I know I'm not a stigma. I know that with God in control of my life, or with you can put him in control of yours, anybody can get out of addiction. Anyone. If I can do it, I know anyone can. Uh, my husband of 13 years um, is doing great, and don't get me wrong, we have had health issues and ups and downs, but I have complete and total faith in Jesus Christ as my Savior. And I know at the end of the day, that's all I need. That's all I need. And he has blessed me beyond measure. I mean, um, I'm grateful to be able to sit and talk to you guys today and let you know that there is hope out there. So if you yourself, if you're struggling with addiction, or if you have a family member, or you know somebody, there's hope. There is hope. You just have to look for it. Pray with them. Keep praying for them, but just don't lose and don't give up that hope. Because that's what they need. They need to see the whole body of Christ. And they need you to be the body of Christ. And let your light shine through to them. And just see what they can have if they just open their eyes and put themselves out there. Um, I've seen lost people uh, turn into great disciple makers along the way. And that can be you. Or that can be someone that you know. Just don't lose faith or lose hope in them. Uh, 
you know, in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And we all fall short most of the time. But I know where I'm headed and I'm enjoying the journey. Every step of the way with God as my pilot. So I want to thank you guys for joining me today. And if you would, please join us this evening at 7 o'clock. We'll be on a Zoom. If you guys have any questions or if there's any way I can help anybody, please let me know. Reach out. Join us tonight. Or if you want to do it, do it in private as well, feel free to message me or email me. You're more than welcome to. Um, but I want to let you guys know that there is hope out there. and There is hope in Jesus. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for allowing me to share my testimony and my path of what I've been down with others. And I just, I pray that you help all that are listening today, Lord. We all struggle and we all fall short daily. And Without you in our lives, we will keep falling short. I pray that if there is someone out there right now, Lord, that is battling with addiction, just to feel the Holy Spirit calling them, Lord, just like you called me, and help plant that seed and help it grow, Lord. I thank you for what you've given me in my life and for how far you've brought me on this journey. And I know truly we could not do it without you in control of our lives. I just pray that it rubs off and it shows on someone else, Lord, to show how we are. And that anyone else can do it as well. Heavenly Father, help us take the tools and help us grow and learn and grow in you. And be better disciples, Lord, and help us share each one of our stories, whether it be addiction or... Whether it be you've been a Christian for 25 years, how remarkable is that, Lord? Help us grow and help us show people how to be more Christ-like. I pray that you're with us in the week to come, Lord, and help us. And I pray for all the women that are watching, Lord. I hope that you just be with us and give us strength and numbers, Lord, and let us know that we have hope out there if we look for it. And we have hope in you, Jesus. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Thank you guys for joining me, and I look forward to seeing you guys tonight at about 7 o'clock. Have a good night. Thanks.